I come from a music-loving family, and any of you who have met or encountered my daughter Anna will appreciate her love of music as well. But the music I grew up with, my earliest memories of, of records being played, of sounds in our household, were uh, deeply steeped in kind of folk Americana. I was raised on healthy doses of Dylan and Woody Guthrie and all of those great sort of folk singers, Pete Seeger of the early 30s, 40s, 50s, and into the 60s. But I also had a city library that was phenomenal and far beyond many that I've encountered since. And it had a great collection of music that you could check out as well. So somewhere around nine, ten years old, I checked out this album by a group called The Pogues. And it was at once familiar and disorienting. Any of you who know that band or know of their legacy, they were a kind of combination in the late 70s, early 80s of both traditional Irish music and the punk aesthetic as well. So it was this very fast-paced, raucous uh, revival of relatively traditional Irish songs. And the lead singer of the Pogues was this man called Shane McGowan, who became something of an icon for me as I grew older. Someone who simultaneously could see the beauty and tradition, appreciate the long historical lineage of our locations as people with histories, as people standing on the shoulders of giants is, is so often reflected. And yet, someone who similarly and simultaneously would chafe at the conventions and find ways of sort of needling and poking at it as well. Well, Shane sadly died a few weeks ago at the age of 65 in Dublin. And he was taken back to his ancestral home in County Tipperary in Nina, a town of about 10,000. So two Fridays ago on December 8th, I tuned in with something like a half million other people around the world to live stream his funeral mass from this Laurel Parish Church in County Tipperary. Now, I say it's a Laurel Parish Church, this is Ireland, so it was like this massive cathedral-style church in our mind. But, but, there were several hundred people that packed into this church to say nothing of the thousands that stood outside listening on speakers and then the thousands, hundreds of thousands of more of us who live streamed it. And it was such a profound moment for me because how often or how rarely, maybe more accurately, is it these days for people to be drawn to a service of the church and the way that they were in this moment at Shane's passing? And this was a significant moment. And I thought about it. I thought about it as I was watching this funeral mass. Because in a way, Shane has always been reflective of what I've imagined John the Baptist must have looked like. And of course, with our readings today, even our readings last week, I've really been put in mind recently of John's presence in this Advent season. And similarly, the way in which Shane and his life kind of reflected that same ideal. And there are a few reasons that I draw this connection. First, with Shane himself and his appearance. For those of you who know nothing of him, he was this rather disheveled man who had this kind of wild and unkept demeanor and he was notorious for just sort of ambling and rambling around being present to the world around him he kind of had this almost uh otherworldly character about him the sort of village insane idiot and yet when people would talk to him and this was commented on several times over the course of 
uh, celebrating his life and his, the days around his funeral, that he was, even in the later stages of life, even at times in his life, racked by issues of uh, substance abuse and, and difficulties that related to that, he had such a clarity of mind, a loving and generous spirit, a way in which he would stop and be in conversation with you, no matter who you were, no matter what your lot in life was. And then, on a second point, there was his funeral. And this was an insanely raucous affair. I have to admit, as someone who is invested in the institution of the church, it gave me no little anxiety sitting there and watching this something like two hour and 45 minute funeral mass. It was, yes, a traditional Roman Catholic funeral mass, but interspersed throughout the entire service were songs from Shane's repertoire, from the Pogue's repertoire, which if any of you are familiar with their music, are not songs that you would generally expect to be sung in a church, let alone a religious service. Nick Cave sang Rainy Night in Soho, for example, and they also sang Fairy Tale of New York, in which people got out of their pews and were dancing in the aisles. Then there was Bono, who read one of the lectionary readings. Johnny Depp was an intercessor. One commenter, after the fact, put it that it was perfectly Shane to have the president of Ireland, Michael Higgins, seated right next to a pink-haired punk on the first row. He was a man who cut through these various rigidities of society and showed the world as it could be. This disorientation of the mass was reflective of the messiness of life, and yet the way in which that messiness speaks to our ultimate humanity. How we as a diverse people come together and find a way of being unified in the diversities and, and tapestries of life experiences that we bring. And even in my own anxieties, I was somewhat of a Nicodemus here. Because there were and I'm going to be a little bit pejorative, but pharisaical voices that have risen up since this service to condemn this mass, to condemn the kind of raucous affair that it was, to criticize the priest and the uh, assembled authorities at this church for allowing such a service to be conducted. And yet, even as I looked on it and thought, oh, this is so disorganized and so uh, uh, un, un sort of uh, uh, um, unusual and, and beyond the, the liturgical bounds, I could see in this moment of this Mass the presence of God, the joy with which people were experiencing the service the way in which the gospel was being proclaimed even in the midst of such an unusual and unlikely setting. And I, with all of my uncertainties about how I feel about it, could nevertheless see the glimmer of truth therein. And that, in a way, sort of brings me then to my third reason for seeing this parallel between Shane and John the Baptist. The presence of God to which Shane pointed throughout his life was both a presence of joy and a mirror through which we see the sorrows of the world. That when we gaze upon the world, even with eyes of beauty, if we're honest, we can't help but see the brokenness as well. Shane was described as a prophet and poetic voice of the Irish diaspora, achingly painful songs of sorrow, loss, and struggle, and yet he would sing them with such a haunting beauty and an optimism for what the world could be, that he was the, gener he was the voice of generations of marginalized folks who saw that kindred spirit, who understood pain, 
yet also found joy and could see better days ahead. And that, that is so reflective of the presence of John. The presence of John, the one crying out in the wilderness. As we hear today, make straight the way of the Lord. There's an implicit recognition that things aren't as they should be, but there is a potential that they could be what they should be. That there is a place a better hope, a better life, a better love in the future. We hear this even more starkly next year in year C. From this Sunday, the third Sunday in Advent, next year we will hear the reading from Luke in which John proclaims, You brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the wrath to come, bear fruits worthy of repentance. So there, there is this sort of simultaneous sense of both sorrow and the recognition of incompleteness and brokenness and the joy and optimism for the life that can be, the life of transformation, of metanoia, of turning around, of experiencing new birth, of experiencing baptism as that new life. And I think this year in particular, it is especially noteworthy to think about holding pain and joy together, of recognizing the ongoing incompleteness with which we are constantly surrounded. This Sunday is traditionally a Sunday of quote-unquote refreshment. That's why we actually have the pink candle. If you remember, I talked a few weeks ago about how, how Advent is historically a sort of mini Lent. It's a penitential season. And just like in Lent, we have this moment sort of halfway through where we recognize the opportunity to step back from the strictures of the fast, step back from the strictures of the penitence, and be reminded of God's joy and God's beauty. We hear this in our Old Testament reading, in our epistle today, this acknowledgement of joy, of optimism, of love and light in the light of God. We also, in our collect, hear this language of being stirred up. And the stirring up historically is the stirring up to joy, the stirring up to celebration. It's also, interestingly, in the British context, the yearly reminder to stir up your Christmas puddings so that they will be ready for Christmas Day. But this year in particular, that stirring up should also be a stirring up of remembrance to us about how things remain incomplete, how much pain and sorrow and suffering continues to exist in the world around us. As I acknowledged at the beginning of our service, we have a number of our own family who are out sick right now, suffering from COVID or other illnesses. RSV is on the rise. It just seems that no matter how frequently we try to battle back against the forces of illnesses these last several years, with each passing month, some new issue arises. That is to say nothing of those who we have lost to certain illnesses or death over these last years and those who are mourning at this time for those losses. This period in Advent can often be a time of sorrow and pain as people look at the joy of getting together with family and remembering in that moment the ones who are no longer with us. And none of that, illnesses, the sorrow of the loved ones we've lost, is to say anything 
about the ongoing issues of violence and destruction in the Middle East. Our brothers and sisters in the Holy Land who at this very hour cannot celebrate either Advent or Christmas because of the strictures and conditions under which they are kept and held captive. And so what do we do? What do we do in this moment where things seem so very fraught and yet we also are invited into joy and refreshment? How do we hold those two things together? Well, I think ultimately that comes back to this sense of baptism. John was a one crying out in the wilderness. He was a one calling out the places of brokenness in this world, calling people of all walks of life to repentance. But it wasn't just repentance. It was repentance into baptism, into new life, into a vision of a future that could be, into the reality of what the world might look like in the light and fuller love of God. So I started with music. I'm going to circle back around on music. Anna and Julie and I were just talking about this recently. We can't quite figure out why. But since her earliest days, has been completely enamored with John Denver. And I, we've mentioned this in homilies before I've mentioned this, that she absolutely loves John Denver. So I'm a vinyl collector, and I have my records down in our basement. Well, she has informed me, as a two, almost three-year-old, that one of her Christmas requests this year is to have country roads on a record. So I am going to have to go out and try to find poems, prayers, and promises if I can locate it somewhere. But in lieu of having country roads on vinyl, she has taken to Rocky Mountain High. So we play that record with quite a bit of frequency in our house right now. And as we were playing it the other night and I was preparing for this sermon this morning, I was captured by those first lines of that title song. He was born in the summer of his 27th year, coming home to a place he had never been before. He left yesterday behind him. You might say he was born again. Baptism is that moment of taking and holding and recognizing the pains and the sorrows and the troubles and the incompletenesses of this world. And yet, acknowledging, lifting up, celebrating the joys, the beauties, the potentials, that new life, that new love, that new completeness in God can bring about. And so on this refreshment Sunday, in the midst of a season that is penitential, maybe especially penitential this year, it's worth acknowledging those locations and places of incompleteness, to be honest and true about them, but to see in that, too, the places of beauty, of joy, of light and life, the places in which we can be refreshed, renewed, and renourished, so that we may more fully experience the love of God. And we have, even in our day and time, these prophets around us who might disorient us, might throw us off, our own complacencies and comfortabilities, but help us, help us to see the wholeness of the world, both in the beauty and the pain, the joys and the sorrows, but to hold those two things together and to lift them up, to bless them, and to share them with the world around us. So let us proclaim anew the gospel of God in this hour, in this time, 
in this place and space in which the world needs to hear the acknowledgement and recognition of brokenness, but also the potential for new life, for change, for transformation, ultimately for love and compassion and wholeness, the possibility of God's presence more fully among us. May we be vessels of that presence. May we feel it within ourselves. And may we carry it forth from this place to the world that so desperately needs it. And may we, as always, glory in a God who loves, nurtures us, and calls us in this transformation more fully to Himself. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.